Thank you, Tom, and the Mile High Band. Um, I'll tell you about the significance of that song. I specifically had requested it of Tom for today. And I'm so happy to share this brief moment in time with Reverend Josh. I asked him if he would actually read the quote the way it is written by um, our popular way of having the quote of Emerson. Yes, from Ralph Waldo Emerson. I often say, if I could live this quote, I'd be the happiest man alive. It goes like this. Finish each day and be done with it. Oh, you have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it serenely and with too high a spirit to be cumbered with your old nonsense. Thank you. I so appreciate his sharing that. And it was interesting because I picked this quote because it's a perfect segue from 2023 to 2024. Because what it does is it reminds us of the importance of letting that stuff go so that we can have a better life. And so that's what the talk is pretty much going to speak to. But I was asked the question why I used in the talk title, Every Day, instead of each day. Well, I am a lifelong learner, so when someone poses a question, I love to get to the answer, if it's possible to get to the answer. And so I looked up if there was a reason why sometimes you saw it as each and sometimes you saw it as every day. And it, then I knew this was the talk I was supposed to give. In 1854, Emerson wrote a letter to his daughter, Ellen, who was having some difficulties in school. She was away at school at the time. And here is what his letter said. Um, and that's why I said the popularized version. But here is what his original letter said to his daughter. You must finish a term and finish every day and be done with it. For manners and for wise living, it is a vice to remember. You have done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as fast as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it well and serenely. And with too high a spirit to be cumbered with your old nonsense, this day for all that is good and fair is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on the rotten yesterday. Isn't it interesting how we clean that up uh, to make it sound? And yet, the reason that this struck me so deeply was that, and if you know anything about me, I have a tendency to get a little emotional sometimes. Um, it reminded me of my own father. When I went to undergrad, started undergraduate school, uh, when things seemed to not be going well, my father would send me postcards of encouragement. And so I thought, wow, this is the talk I'm supposed to give because then I know my father is right here with me. And, and the reason I love this song that Tom just sang is not only does it remind me that God is always there for me and always holding me up and always helping me get through times, but it also always reminds me of my own father. My own father who was a Renaissance man and encouraged me to be and do anything because everything was a possibility. And what you don't know is this is a man who was born in 1898 and there was, he came through a time when he watched automobiles, um, telephones, you, he saw all of this happening. And as a woman, you know that it was a difficult time then, but he said to me, you can be and do anything you want. And that's what I believe the relationship was that Emerson had with his daughter, Ellen. Actually, as she got older, she traveled with him uh, on many of his, the trips that he took around the world, and she actually became his assistant. So he had a very close relationship. So 
this is for my dad. <laughs> Actually, my daddy. For those of you who don't use that term, I have always referred to him as daddy. So, um, so the other thing that came to me as I was preparing this talk was A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. One of the first characters you see, if, if you even in reading the book, but if you've watched the movie, is Jacob Marley. And in a way, this talk speaks to the fact that Jacob Marley came to see Ebenezer Scrooge right at the beginning to tell him what he was in for. And remember, he had the chains on him. He was carrying around all that past muck. And so I thought, well, that's the other thing we don't want to do. We don't want to carry around all of the past. We want to be able to let it go. So before I get into my talking points, I want to ask you, and this is not true confessions. This is a, an internal thing I'd like you to think about. Do you have things that you are carrying around with you that you haven't been able to let go of that's, that are impacting your life? You know they're impacting your life, but you can't seem to find a way to let it go. Hopefully today when you leave here, you'll have some idea of how you can start working to remove these things so that you don't step into that brand new year that we have coming tomorrow and carry it with you like the chains of Jacob Marley. Maybe that's a visual you should have. Is, is that what I want my life to look like? Now, I will say, I, I can't speak directly to trauma. That's a whole different thing. But I'm speaking to the general absurdities of life that happen that we tend to carry around with us. So the first step is to let it go. And of course, I could have had Tom sing, you know, from Frozen, I suppose. Um, but letting it go, that is, a, that is an easy thing to say and a tough thing to do. So I'm going to tell you a story. At one time, um, people were, hunters were trying to hunt monkeys. And monkeys are very fast. And the monkeys would run up the trees and hide out in the greenery of, of the tree. And they just could not catch these monkeys. So someone came up with a brilliant idea. They took a jar and they filled the jar with some of the something that the monkey really loved, probably food, and put it in the jar and put these jars at the base of the trees. And then the hunters hid. After some time, the monkeys came down out of the trees, saw these jars, said, wow, look, bonus, I don't have to hunt for food. I hear food right here. Put their hand in the jar squeezed their hand, and you know what happened? The jar came with them. They couldn't get what was inside that jar unless they found another way, but they were so intent, and that's what we do. And so, of course, they got captured by the hunters. Brilliant, but that's what we do. It's some, another visual for us to think about. How many times do we reach in the jar to something that looks like something we want, we hold on to it so tightly that it kind of takes over our life? I taught a class a little while ago, and there's some folks in the room here who took this class, so um, you can doze off for this moment. <laughs> but it's, it was from um, Michael Singer, Living Untethered. And in his, he talks about, we, we kind of function in a three-ring circus, and we're going to talk about the first ring, which is everything that's outside of us is what we focus on. And now, what do we do with that? How do we take it in? We have to be very careful how we take it in because of what it can do to our mind if we're not careful. He talks about samskaras. And samskaras are from the yogic tradition, and they're impressions that are left in our mind from things that happened. So something negative happens, and what do I do with it? Do I let it just move through me, or do I stop it and hold it into my mind 
and eventually it moves into my heart. And you know when that has happened, what's happening to you as a human being. You're unhappy. So many things feel wrong. And he says we must learn how to allow that to move outside of ourselves. Resist it. Resist it. When, you know, when it's right in your face, sometimes it's like, how am I gonna, going to resist this? Don't attach to it. Of course, that's the whole concept of surrender. Ooh, there's a hard one for us. How do we surrender? But what, what you need to try to learn to do is to let those impressions go. Don't let them stick to you. And that's exactly what Emerson is saying to his daughter. Absurdities happen in life. And, you know, of course, in our day and time, you could say that to your child, and they'd probably go, yes, but you don't really know, Mom or Dad, what this is like. And it's true. Everybody's got to work through their own samskaras, but try to let it pass through, because what happens is you hold on to it, and then every time something happens in your life similar, it's piling on. And we don't want to carry that. We want to let it go. We want to take his advice and say, all right, that was absurd, that was ridiculous to happen, but don't hold on to it. He's, this, this is an interesting thing for all of us to think about. When we hold on to these concepts out there, these things that are happening, happening to us, are they happening right now? No. So why? Do you understand the absurdity of it? Why do we hold on to it? It's not even happening now. You see the power of the mind. And that's the beauty of this teaching is that we can start to move out of that if we really take it in. If we really re realize that there's a lot more to this life than what we're seeing out here. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, and Raymond Charles Barker in the 365 um, Science of Mind said this, let us then cease weeping over the shortcomings and mistakes and evils of our yesterdays and steadfastly beholding the face of the great and divine reality, let us resolve to walk in the light where there is no darkness. So we're all going to learn how to let it go. Maybe singing the song will help. I don't know. But the second point is to trust yourself. And I think the second, that song that uh, Tom sang about the heart, opening the heart, that's what this is all about. Trust yourself. You have an internal mechanism that will give you all the right answers, folks. You don't have to rely on all the social media, the television, all of those things that go on. You can trust yourself. Carl Jung talks about poles, that we, we seem to be, be attracted to one pole or another, and the one that I'm going to mention to you are fear and trust. If you live in fear, you cannot trust. David Stendhal um, Rast, who is someone I've, just an aside note here, that during the pandemic, um, I got very interested in the whole notion of contemplation, of getting to that quiet space, of really getting inside and being able to see what's going on there. And one of the authors, one of many authors that I was introduced to was David Stendhal Rast, and he talks about there being a distinction between fear and anxiety. He says, fear is optional, folks. Fear is optional. Anxiety isn't. Anxiety is actually a natural part of our beingness. So how do we handle it? The definition of anxiety might be choking. And in the Latin, the anxiety actually means a narrowing, a narrowness. And he talks about the fact that fear doesn't like that narrowness. It 
we want nothing to do with narrowness when we're in fear. And yet the truth of it is that for many of us, we were born through a narrow birth canal. And what happened? New life. So why not look at anxiety or that narrowness as another opportunity for new life, something new to come to you? So do you see what I'm trying to help you see is language is huge in how we see ourselves and how we see the world. It's not just in the words that people speak, but what am I saying to myself? What am I saying to myself? I also have been introduced to an author recently uh, whose name is Loretta Coleman Brown. And she has written a book called What Makes You Come Alive, A Spiritual Walk with Howard Thurman. And she tells this story, speaking of trusting yourself, trusting that inner voice. She tells the story that when she had just finished her academic training, she was living in the Great Smoky Mountains. For those of you who are not East Coasters, you may not know that. It sits between Tennessee, that area sits between Tennessee and North Carolina. It's a beautiful part of our country. Shenandoah River, Blue Ridge Mountains, you know that whole song. Uh, <laughs> that it's a beautiful part of our country. And she was living there at the time. And she had gotten um, an offer for an academic position in, at Swarthmore in Pennsylvania. And so she's contemplating what to do, and she decides not to take the position. All right. Any of you who have been children or have children, when the opportunity comes for their first job, and they say, no, I'm not going to take it. Her family was beside themselves. They said, you have no other opportunity. And she said, no, I just feel like this isn't right for me. Five years later, she had accepted a position at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And at that time, she was diagnosed as needing a heart transplant. And she found a surgeon uh, who she really loved that was going to do the surgery, and he said to her, you're so fortunate that you don't live on the East Coast. And she was, uh, and why would that be? And he said, there are so many transplant centers on the East Coast, all vying for the same organs. And he said, out here, there's only one, and it's at UCLA in California. He said, and many people are offering up those organs. And you've got a good blood type, you've got your body mass is good. We'll be able to easily find a heart for you. And he said, but if you were on the East Coast, it's quite likely that you would die before you had your heart transplant. She trusted that inner voice. She didn't know. She had no, you know, uh, wouldn't that be nice to have a magic ball that you could look at to say, this is why I'm not doing this. But look at what, how profound that is in her life. And you may not have a profound experience like that, but trust yourself. Go inside. Listen. And we're going to talk about that in the next step, the importance of that inner work we have to do. Right now, I want to share with you, at this time, my very favorite Howard Thurman quote. There is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. No one knows you better than you know yourself. So trust yourself. The final point is to be present. 
You know, we spend a lot of time out here in the past, and then we think about what's happening in the future. The present moment is right here. And I have to think that Emerson might have said, the moment. Absurdities happen all the time. Live in this moment. Be in this moment. The rest has happened. You're not sure what's happening in the future, but live in this moment. You'll be so much happier. And how do we do that? He says, Emerson says that just remember that this day, this moment is all there is. It's all you have. Isn't it interesting how we spend so much time thinking about the past, looking for the future? This moment is all we have. Someone said to me this morning out in the lobby and that I said, so how's the new year going to be for you? And, and the comment was made, well, if I wake up tomorrow, that's living in the moment. That's recognizing this is your moment. Sean Ginwright, another new author I've been introduced to, uh, wrote, has written The Four Pivots, and I highly recommend, I recommend all of these books. Some of them we have in this bookstore, some we don't, but I recommend them all. But, but Sean Ginwright um, makes the comment that we're addicted to frenzy. If we were living in the present moment, that, we, that wouldn't be so true but we're addicted to frenzy. And he uses the, an example from his early life uh, when he was establishing himself. He was traveling all over the country and he would get to the airport and he had young children at the time and his father, he'd talk to his father on the phone and his father would say to him, Sean, your children will not be this age forever. And I think that's such a huge thing for us to remember. If we live in this moment, we can appreciate all our loved ones around us. We can appreciate them now. We don't have to say, well, when I achieve this or when I get there. But you know very well that we've just come out of a season of what I call frenzy. Just think about it. You've been in stores. People are trying to get the last whatever special gift there is for the children this year. It's who we are. We seem to be addicted to it. So what we need to do is find a way to get addicted to calm. You know, wouldn't that make a world that works for everybody if we all would just calm down? Of course, my mother's words in my ears as a young child, you know, calm down, calm down. But I mean that seriously as we uh, look at the present. So make sure that you go inside because that's your divine design in there. So I really encourage you to do that. So here are some suggestions on how you get to present. And you all should know what the big one is. Do your daily practices. I hope you all have a daily practice. There is not a one-size-fits-all in daily practices. You may be a prayer. You may be a meditator. You may be a contemplator. You may be a journaler. You may be someone who uses a gratitude journal at the end of every day or the beginning of every day. Um, you may live with compassion. You may live with forgiveness. Those are all practices. But I encourage you to practice, to do that. And so another thing that is important to me is nature. I live in the foothills, and there is nothing that will bring you back to the present moment more than stepping into nature. And Loretta Coleman Brown says, find a bench to sit on and just sit. Find a path that you enjoy walking on. I know for me, we have a pond in our neighborhood and I love to walk around it and be with nature. Nature doesn't expect anything. Nature is there. Nature is the great teacher, and Howard Thurman believed that. He said, nature was a balm for us. So many, and look what Emerson wrote. One of his first great works was nature. 
So nature is a great healer, and I encourage you all, I know it's a little harder in the winter to do that, but find a way. And then, as you're in nature, ask spirit a question. Don't be afraid. Ask spirit a question, and then wait for the answer. Now, that doesn't mean you have to sit on that rock or sit on that bench waiting for spirit to answer you. But you will be surprised how spirit does answer you if you trust yourself and you trust that inner voice that is always speaking to you. Always, always. Howard Thurman, I love this also. He says, the spirit of God dances with us all the time. And do you know what our responsibility is? to be a good dance partner. So I encourage us as we look at this and we think about being present, we're gonna let go, we're gonna let it go first, whatever that stuff is we've been enjoying, I guess, carrying around. We're going to trust ourselves and then we're going to work on being present, however that looks to us. So, are you ready to do that? All right, I'm glad to hear that. So, I'm going to give you some information to take home with you also. And I apologize to those online. You know, I'm a newbie. What do I know? Um, there's a card that uh, they should be handing out to you as you leave, our ushers. Thank you for that, ushers. And it's a little journal practice that you can use. And this is end of year because Reverend Josh is going to do his intention setting tomorrow, but this, these are end-of-year practices. So the journal practice is to sit down and, and think about what did I accomplish in 2023? What did I do that I'd never done before? What new things did you learn? And finally, what do you want to shed from 2023 as you enter 2024? Now, that last one is often used as a burning bowl experience. So you write down what it is you don't want to take with you, and then carefully you might want to take it outside and burn it. No. But um, So these are available for you. This is a suggested practice. But in addition, I have put out on the guest services counter a list of New Year's Eve practices from around the world. They're really fascinating. And this, I apologize. I will say to our online or to anyone in the room who doesn't get one of these, you can Google or do an internet search on exactly this, New Year's Eve practices around the world, and it will give you many more than these. But here are some. Um, one of them that I have, I'm going to give you all to think about in Ireland they sleep on mistletoe. New Year's Eve into New Year's Day. Do you know why? It improves their love life in the next year. <laughs> so there's one, but there are many there from many parts of the world, and I encourage you to take them. And make your own practice. Make your own practice, because... Elizabeth Gilbert said this about the new year. She says, you only get one brand new, unsoiled, unspoiled, beautiful, and fresh new year once a year. One time. Use it well. Let us pray. If our practitioner prayer partners will stand, please, and hold in consciousness this wonderful center of love and light, all of those who are online, we include them in this prayer, lifting all up as we close out this 2023 year. We're going to let go of those things that no longer serve us, and we're going to remember that absurdities happen in life, and when they come at us, we let them pass through. We don't hold on to them. We let them go. Because we know that tomorrow is a brand new day. And we're going to trust ourselves by going inside and really 
discovering God within us. And we're going to be present. We're going to do those beautiful practices that help us come alive. That help us come alive. We're going to let it go. Trust ourselves. And then we're going to be present. We're going to end 2023 being present. Being present to the divine. I'm so deeply thankful for the truth. For the truth that God is all there is, no matter how we choose to see God. Because there is a power within each one of us that's greater than we are. And we can use it. Thank you, Spirit. Thank you to this beautiful community we call Mile High, here with us this morning and with us online. Thank you. Thank you for the gifts each person brings. And as we just take this in, we take a deep breath, we let it out. knowing that we are recognizing, recognizing our humanity. What can we bring to this world of ours to make it a world that works for everyone? Thank you, Spirit. And so it is.